Choosing the right EQ. How do you know which one you should use? Today we're gonna to talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Cole Caparoon. Thank you for stopping by for another video. Uh, this is a pretty subjective topic. First of all, let me say that there's no right and wrongs with any of this stuff. What I wanna do is explain to you my philosophy on how I choose EQs give based on a given track or a goal that I'm trying to accomplish. So for the sake of this conversation, let's say that there are two styles of EQ. We're gonna talk about plugins. The same pretty much applies to hardware, but there are what I would call digital EQs and analog emulation EQs. Now digital EQs are gonna be like your fab filter or your Kirchhoff or anything like that really. Um, and they all do pretty much the same thing. However, they don't sound the same. But the reason they sound different from one another is completely different than the reason why hardware emulations sound different from one another. When you're talking digital EQs, the reason why they don't all sound identical, in my opinion, is basically because of the coding. How well do they code these EQs? Now there's a number of other factors in terms of, you know, whether it's linear phase or, or there's a bunch of different factors into it. Uh, the curves, the actual curves of the EQ itself. But generally speaking, these digital style EQs like a fab filter are very, very transparent. They don't really sound like anything. So I wanted to start with these because how do you choose the right digital EQ? Well, for me, it's easy. Just try them and see which one you think sounds better. There are two for me that I use all the time. The FabFilter Pro Q3 and the Kirchhoff EQ. Now, I think that generally speaking, the Kirchhoff does sound better. It's not by much, but it does sound better in my opinion. However, the Kirchhoff is much slower to use. It takes a lot longer to dial stuff in. The fab filter is so fast and so easy. So I'm constantly juggling back and forth between the fab filter and the Kirchhoff depending on what I'm wanting to accomplish. If I'm EQing something where it is very, very important in the mix, usually we're talking kick, snare, vocal, that sort of thing, and I want the maximum sonic quality, then I'll go with the Kirchhoff. If I'm wanting the to get through it quickly so that way uh, I can move on because speed is an important part of mixing and mixing well in my opinion because you got to keep your ears fresh. So if it's something less critical, I'll just grab the fab filter. Um, and so I'm constantly back and forth between those two for my digital EQs. Now digital EQs are really good at being transparent at sculpting a sound or solving a problem without imparting any character into the track. And it's for this reason that if I'm trying to fix problems in a track, I'm always reaching for this digital style plugin first. If something's muddy or boxy or if there's a resonance and I need to notch something out, these are always the EQs that I reach for when I'm trying to solve problems. Now the other style of EQ, we're talking about hardware emulations typically here, uh, they are going to have more character. Now these are mass generalizations that I'm making here, but generally speaking, hardware emulation EQs are going to have significantly more character. There's gonna be, in a lot of them, or most of them, there's gonna be some component of saturation in there, there's gonna be some component of some phase shift in there, there's gonna be some harmonic content in there, there's gonna be some built-in thing that happens when you just put the plug in on the track before you even start turning any knobs. The good ones do that anyway. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of things that happen in the hardware emulation EQ side of things that is just a lot more going on under the hood than the digital like fab filter style EQs. So how do you know which hardware emulation to use? Now I wish I could sit here and just say, use this one, it's the best but I can't. Not only can I not because there are too many different ones that I use for different things, what I am looking for when I'm trying to sculpt a track is it could be different than what you're looking for. So here's how I handle this. When I get a new EQ, a plug-in or hardware, I test it out thoroughly. Not in a session that I'm mixing, on a song that's either already mixed or so on some tracks that haven't been mixed yet, but not on something I'm trying to be productive on. I want to learn the EQ and its strengths 
and its weaknesses. Every single EQ has strengths and weaknesses, and the only way that you can find out what these are is to experiment with it. So I break this down into a couple different categories, and I just make mental notes of this stuff. The first one is what is the top end like? Is it super sweet top end? Is it super hard, aggressive top end? Is it the sort of top end where you can rip 15 dB of boost and it still sounds incredible? Or is it the sort of EQ that you, you can't be that heavy handed with it? I'm nearly always starting with the top end character of the EQ. And then I make a mental note, which things are better at what? How steep is are the curves? Uh, is it better for on drums or vocals? Or is it fine on both? Is it a really great one for guitars? Or is this a really great one for bass? And I'm making these mental notes and then I usually move to the low end. How thick is the low end when I boost it? And in addition to how thick is it, how solid is it? There are some EQs that as you boost the low end, things get floppy and flabby and loose. Sometimes that's exactly what you want. Sometimes I want something that's super tight while being super thick. And so just experimenting with these EQs and making mental notes of their character, same with the mid range and same with the character of the box. When I just put the box on the track without turning any knobs, what does it do? And then on top of that, what's the overall character of the box? Is it fairly transparent where it'll work on a bunch of stuff? Does it have a lot of character baked in where it doesn't work on a lot of stuff? Only you can experiment and try this out. I, I can't, it does no good for me to sit here and tell you what EQs are what to me because they won't be the same to you. But I make mental notes of the stuff and then I know when I'm mixing, when I'm under the clock and I'm under the gun and I, I it's time to be productive, we're working here, then I automatically know what EQ to reach for when I want to accomplish a particular goal. This track that I'm mixing, this guitar for instance, I need it to be have more clarity, but the top end is already kind of harsh. So that means I'm probably gonna reach for like a softer, gooier sounding EQ that has a sweet top end. Uh, if I am doing a kick drum on some indie singer songwritery thing and I want more low end on the kick drum, but it doesn't have to be super tight and super hard like an EDM track or like a, a metal track. Well, then I would generally reach for something that's kind of softer and gooier. But if I'm doing that hard metal track, I want that super in, that low end to be super tight and well defined. And so I will choose a different EQ to work on the low end based on the character of the EQs. And this is why I think it's so important to spend time experimenting with your plugins. This is also why it's so important not to have too many of them. You know, back in the day, the era that I came up in, like everyone was like getting crack mercury, waves mercury bundles, which had, I don't know, 2000 plugins or however many plugins it was. It was just an absurd amount of plugins. And when I saw people do that, I knew that their mixes probably weren't that great because you have what they call paralysis by analysis or option anxiety. There's a bunch of different names for it, but basically you have too many options. You couldn't possibly wrap your head around what 400 different EQs sound like. You can't. And so the chances of you choosing the right one at the right time is basically zero. And it's for exactly this reason that when I'm mixing, at least for plugins, I'm usually only using five, six, maybe seven different EQs on the whole mix. Now there's a bunch of instances of them, but I'm usually only using a couple different ones. Now the five that I use might be different for a hard rock song than it is for a, a pop song or an indie singer songwriter song. Those might be a different group of five, but usually if I'm trying to accomplish a particular goal on a song, there's a particular few plugins that fit that vibe really well and that's what I'm using. There are links down below to a whole bunch of plugins that I do use and to a whole bunch of other gear that I use. Um, and so go check those links out. Those links go to Sweetwater. Thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring this video. Anytime you need any piece of musical gear, you can jump on any one of my videos, click on any one of the links, purchase anything you were gonna buy anyway, costs you nothing extra, really helps me out and helps me keep making videos like this. So thank you, Sweetwater, for sponsoring this video. But I really want to encourage you guys to spend time getting to know your tools. If you don't know 
exactly why you would reach for a particular EQ, then you need to spend more time experimenting. Because not only do you need to move fast in a mix so that way you maintain fresh perspective and you're mixing with the freshest ears all the time, you also don't wanna waste, like you don't wanna uh, lose that perspective or, or lose like the goal, the mindset, the, the finish line in your head by playing around with different stuff. So experiment with all of your tools when you're not under the gun, when you're not on the clock, so to speak. And then you'll have a better understanding, make mental notes of every single tool, so that way you know when I have a kick drum or a vocal and it sounds like this and I need to do this to it, that is the best EQ for this job. There's no such thing as the best EQ. There's no such thing as even the best EQ for vocals. And I also don't want you to get fooled into thinking that you need a bunch of EQs, because you don't. I mean, I'd be just fine mixing everything with the Fab Filter if I needed to. Hell, I'd do everything with the stock Pro Tools EQ if I needed to. But there are things that are better than other things for specific jobs. And I think it's a good idea to have, like if you just have the Fab Filter or the Kirchhoff, or both if you can afford it, but if you just have one or the other, and then you have two or three different character EQs, maybe a Pultec, maybe some sort of channel strip, you know, SSL or API or Neve sort of thing, and then something else with a completely different character, some sort of bus com bus EQ, a, a curve bender, the SPLPQ, like there's a bunch of different options. But really, if you, you really only need a transparent EQ, like a digital EQ, and three or four different uh, hardware emulation EQs, and I feel like the vast majority of people are not gonna be held back if they just have that many options. We don't, we don't need 300 different EQ plugins. It's pointless to do so. So anyway, get to know your tools. And that's it. That's all there is. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Don't forget to hit the links in the description. All right, peace.